Hi, my name is Jared, and this is Horror Obsession. Today, Slasher School... <laughs> ...continues with a look at a trope which is really more of a specific, defining moment in the plot of a typical slasher film. As we talked about in my What is a Slasher movie video, the general structure is a masked villain kills off a bunch of attractive teens one by one. Now. The problem most screenwriters have with this concept is they have to invent some reason why the kids don't just leave the area or run away. Running away is the obvious solution to their slasher problems, and what most of us would probably do in real life. And worst of all for the writers is, it would probably work. I mean, even with some Leslie Vernon level cardio. You have no idea how much cardio I have to do. It's ridiculous. Why so much? There's that whole thing of making it look like you're walking, and everybody else is running their asses off. I don't think one person would catch a bunch of teens running in different directions all at once. So what to do? Well, in Nightmare on Elm Street, this problem is solved brilliantly since Freddy butchers you in your sleep, so running doesn't really help. There is the thought that maybe leaving town, aka Elm Street, might stop Freddy, but if you've watched the series, you know that doesn't work. I think constructing the mythology of your villain to be inescapable regardless of location is the best solution to this problem. For example, in The Terminator, where they try running basically the entire movie, but he keeps catching up. Or even in It Follows, where part of the movie's rules are the villain will never stop chasing you, the inevitability of which produces most of the terror. Most slashers are more grounded, like Chucky, Jason, or Michael, so if your villain is a mortal individual person, how can you keep your cast of victims in one location long enough to off everyone? Another option is to trap everyone in a single location, such as I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, where the cast is trapped on an island during a storm and can't leave. This is very similar to the iconic mystery story Ten Little Indians, which is arguably just a slasher film, or April Fool's Day, where the group of friends get trapped on an island in a storm. The last solution, and the one employed most frequently, for example in the Friday the 13th series, is to have a starting gun. Set. There's the starting. A starting gun is the moment the cast of victims, specifically the final girl, realizes there is a killer on the loose and that they are in danger. The kills preceding the starting gun are generally one or two people who sneak off from the group to perform some kind of sinful act. The sin factor! It's a sin! It's an extension of number one! Such as having sex, drinking, or doing drugs. These kills generally are and should be relatively early in the movie. You want to spread the kills out somewhat evenly, and these kills you can really take your time with, since none of the other characters know there is danger at all, so there is no urgency. Once the starting gun happens, the remaining cast will either be running away or fighting back, and this is typically reserved for the climax of the film where the final girl empowers herself with some kind of weapon, not the kind of thing you want happening too early. Hitchcock has said, in order to create suspense, you want to bomb under the table of your scene, which the audience knows about, but the characters do not. Four people are sitting around the table, talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information. The slasher is the bomb under the table of these movies, and letting the characters in on the secret too early will unravel the suspense of subsequent scenes. I will discuss this more in my Final Girl video, but I wanted to touch on the concept of an active investigative gaze, a term used to describe the character in a movie who is actively seeking out information to unravel some kind of mystery, which in slasher films is either how or why the kills are happening. If you have the starting gun early, Early, the final girl will be investigating why the kills are happening. Fred Krueger, Mom. Fred Krueger. Do you know who that is, Mother? 
Because if you do, you better tell me because he's after me now. And if there is no starting gun early, she will be figuring out that the kills are happening. The active investigative gaze is an important tool for slasher movies because it gives the character something meaningful to do while the slashings take place, rather than passively sitting around waiting to encounter the killer, an incredibly boring state of affairs for any protagonist. I'm the protagonist. So what are some examples of the starting gun? In the original Halloween, 1978, Lori is babysitting while her friends are sneaking off to bang their boyfriends, essentially suicide in the slasher film. Lori doesn't notice any of the deaths because she is isolated in her babysitting house, which means her starting gun happens an hour and 15 minutes into the movie when she sees Annie lying beneath Judith Meyer's tombstone. As is standard for slashers, especially the early ones, she then sees the dead body bodies of all her friends who have been conveniently stashed in the room to produce jump scares. Lori still doesn't know how much danger she is in until Michael appears right behind her in this brilliant shot. Watch out, Jamie. You know he's around. He, you know? Oh, oh, there he is. I told you. I told you he's right around the corner. Jamie. Jamie. Jamie, look behind you. Look behind you. Turn around. Behind you. Oh, turn around. Behind you. Behind you, Jamie. And from that moment on, the game of survival between Laurie and Michael is officially on. In Friday the 13th Part 2, the cast of victims gets split up between the kids who stay at the house and those who go into town to the bar. The starting gun comes an hour and eight minutes into the movie when Ginny and Paul finally come back from the bar to find the house empty and Ginny stumbles into Jason. In the first Friday movie, after Alice discovers the axe, they assume whatever is happening is a prank, a classic way to slow down the attempted escape. The last starting gun I want to talk about is in Midsommar. You can check out my video if you want my full thoughts on the movie, but for me the movie is basically a slasher film with the entire Harga being the villain rather than any individual slasher. They slowly whittle down the cast of characters by killing the couple that tries to leave, to killing Josh for looking at the book, to killing Mark for peeing on a tree, until it is only Danny and Christian left. What about Josh though? I'm honestly not too concerned. The brilliance of this movie, and also what I think many people found extremely annoying, is that the starting gun for Midsommar never really happens at all. The movie gives the audience and the characters all the information they need to see the danger, but disguise it with bright lighting, song and dance, costumes, and a sense of community. Danny gets essentially hypnotized and indoctrinated into the cult rather than having a starting gun. The subversion of this plot structure by Ari Aster I think plays best for people like me who are obsessed with horror movies. If they'd watch Palm Night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect and consciously thinking about stuff like this while watching, as this is basically like ending a Halloween movie with Laurie Strode saying, fuck it, I'm actually joining Michael, I dig his whole mystery serial killer vibe. Overall, the starting gun is a tool used by slasher screenwriters to solve the conundrum of how to keep their characters isolated in the killing fields, until it's time for a good old fashioned reaping. Victims splitting up and running away, or calling someone for help, or banding together to search for weapons just sounds exhausting, and ain't nobody got time for that. Instead, keep the victims in the dark about the murders until there are only a few left and it's far too late for any silly nonsense like escaping. Up next, I will talk about the disappearing body trope and how it ties into the starting gun. 